So praise God and welcome once again, dear brothers and sisters, to our session this evening, Are Your Nets Breaking? And our objective is, our main objective is, uh, is to see, is to continually see and walk in net breaking success in our life. In net breaking success. That is what will make the world turn around and look at us and say, hey, there's something different about you. You're, when, when everyone is crushed and cast down, defeated, struggling in this world, you are succeeding. You are flourishing. And, and that is what is going to make the world turn around and say, I want to be like you. I want to be like you. And get down, get to the bottom of, you know, how is it that you're succeeding when everyone else is failing? How is it that you're experiencing blessing? And that is an opportunity, brothers and sisters, for us to speak about our Savior, the one in whose footsteps we walk, because he is the one who walked always with his nets breaking, with his nets breaking, okay? So dear brothers and sisters, are you seeing net breaking success in your lives or is this your condition? Is this your condition? It may not be completely empty nets, but very few fish, few and far between. Once in a blue moon, some success. The rest of the time, miserable failure. Okay? So if this is how your life is, remember, this is not God's will for you. This is not God's will for you. And that is why you need to realign, sync with the word, sync with the spirit. So that the Holy Spirit can take you exactly where Jesus wants you to be today and always. So in introduction, dear brothers and sisters, we're beginning with a very familiar, familiar story. A low moment in Peter's life. In fact, that time he was still called Simon. And what was happening? He and his partners, his brother, Andrew, James and John, we're all washing empty nets. I'm sure, you know, this This feels like a, like probably, you know, when you look at your life, are you also doing the same thing? Are you washing empty nets? Are you feeling, you know, unsuccessful? Are you frustrated? Are you experiencing defeat? Are you feeling helpless, anxious? Fearful about the future. That's what happens when a period over a period of time, if you find yourself unsuccessful and whatever you're doing is not working out, that's what will happen. There will be anxiety over the future. There will be there will be fear when you think of the future for yourself, for your family, for your children, for your children's children. If this is you, dear brothers and sisters, maybe you're doing all the right things and yet experiencing failure. You feel you're doing the right things, okay? You cannot be doing all the right things and fail. Because if you are doing the right things, you will not fail. But maybe to you, you think, but I'm doing all the right things. I'm being faithful. I go to church. I give my tithes. I do this. I do that. I'm not sure what you're, what you're saying to yourself. But if you're seeing failure, then there is something wrong. There's definitely something wrong. Things are just not working out. If that's you, dear brothers and sisters, this is exactly where Peter was when Jesus walked into his life. In Luke chapter 5, verse 1 onward, we read, on one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Genesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had got out of them and were washing their nets. Jesus steps into Peter's boat. That's the time. That is that moment in all eternity when time stood still for Peter. When time really stood still for Peter because Jesus stepped into his boat. Okay? And what happened? He just got in. Jesus got getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's. He asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Okay? 
And what happened? And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Okay? So this was a very crucial moment for Peter when Jesus made, gave him a command like this. Okay? What did Peter do? Peter was amazing. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And we know what happened, dear brothers and sisters. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Okay, I'm sure we all have had, heard this. We've read this many times. We've heard this in church being read. And, and you know, we know this is a very, very important moment in the life of Peter and Andrew, James, and Simon and Andrew, James and John. Okay, so. Yes, dear brothers and sisters, Jesus sat down and taught the people from Peter's boat. But as he was doing it, what was Peter doing? He was washing his nets, but obviously listening to Jesus. And guess what? Who else came to listen to Jesus? All the fish in the lake came to listen to him. They came to listen to Jesus. That's true. That's true. Their creator was standing in their lake and preaching. So even the fish came. Even the fish came. If if Francis of Assisi could preach to the fish, why not Jesus? Of course, Jesus could have, you know, even the fish would have come, you know, swimming from everywhere in the lake to listen to Jesus. And what happened? And that's why he responded. He was listening. Peter was responding because he had heard Jesus preach. We don't know what he was saying. Obviously, he's speaking about the kingdom of God. That was Jesus' mission. That was Jesus' message to speak about the kingdom of God. And when Jesus was preaching there, sitting in Peter's boat, Peter was listening. And that, that is what prompted him to respond when Jesus spoke to him. When Jesus spoke to him, Jesus will never, you know, do something in our life and leave, leave us unrewarded. Jesus had borrowed Peter's boat for that little while. For a little while, he just sat in his boat and preached. He wanted to say thank you. Jesus wanted to thank Peter. Why do you think he did this? Why do you think he did this? He could have just gotten off the boat and said thank you and gone. No. He did not want to do that. Because he wanted to thank Peter for allowing him to use his boat. For allowing him to use his boat, dear brothers and sisters. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. Sometimes, you know, we look back at our failures and say, Oh, this is no use. It didn't work. Last time when I did it, it didn't work. Is it going to work now? Am I going to see anything? Am I going to see a change? Maybe sometimes the Holy Spirit is telling you to do something, something you've done before. You've tried before. Maybe this is your response. I did it earlier. Nothing happened. But are you going to respond like Peter? But at your word, I will let down the nets. Dear brothers and sisters, this is a very, very important phrase in this sentence that Peter spoke. He said, at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. The nets were breaking. So if you and I want to see the nets breaking in our life, we need to do what Peter did. At his word, we need to let down our nets. We need to obey. We need to surrender. We need to yield. We need to stop resisting the Holy Spirit who's speaking to us through the word and obey. Unconditional obedience. So you and I, dear brothers and sisters, if we do this, 
We can live like this. And this is how we should. With nets breaking. With nets breaking. That is God's will for us. That is what the Father wants. That is the will of the Father. That is the, that is the way Jesus lived. And that is Jesus, you know, modeled for us. The perfect life on earth of a child of God, of a son of God, and a daughter of God. And, and that is the way the Holy Spirit makes anyone who surrenders to the Spirit of God a resounding, unimaginable success. And that's you and me, dear brothers and sisters. That's our calling. So the objectives of this session are to question, to ask ourselves, do we want to see our nets breaking? If yes, why our nets should be breaking? Why our nets should be breaking? Because there is there is a there is great value in walking in success. And how to experience net breaking success in our lives? Sorry. And and at times, why we struggle to see our nets breaking? Why we struggle to see nets breaking? Why we experience failure in our life? And we ensure. So that we can ensure our nets are always breaking by yielding to the Holy Spirit. That is the key, dear brothers and sisters. All that Jesus did from the very moment of his baptism, beginning his public ministry, the Holy Spirit took over his life. Although he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, his private life was quite ordinary and insignificant. And that is how God allowed it to be. But the moment Jesus' public ministry began, the Holy Spirit was in charge. Jesus didn't do anything on his own. Every moment of his life, he lived, yielded to the Holy Spirit. And that's how Jesus always walked. Successful, triumphant, victorious. And that's how you and I ought to walk. And that's that's what will happen if we keep on yielding to the Holy Spirit. If we keep on praying in tongues. If we keep on standing on the word. That's the kind of life the Holy Spirit wants us to have. Wants us to live. Okay? So do we want to see our nets breaking? I'm sure you're saying yes. I'm very sure you're saying yes. Okay? So if you and I want to see our nets breaking, we need to do what Peter did. At your word, I will let down my nets for a catch. So we need to act on the word. We need to act on the word. And then we will walk in success always. We will always walk like this. Overflow, in the abundance. We have, you, you remember my teaching I gave a few weeks ago on the sufficiency gospel. The word sufficiency means more than enough. Enough to spare, to share. That is the life that you and I are called to walk in. Not in poverty. So we have nothing. We are struggling. And then definitely we will have nothing to give. That is not God's will for us. And not living in such luxury and abundance that you are flying in your own, uh, you know, you have your own yacht and you have a hundred mansions here and you're rolling in money. That also is not God's will for us. God wants us to live having enough and more to spare. Maybe some, some are rich, some are very rich. But if you are very rich, then you have a responsibility to give more for the kingdom of God. To give more for the kingdom of God. It's not just keep buying fight of, you know, your, your own private jets and to have enough, so many mansions and to have enough, uh, you know, so many cars. And that is, that is not the kind of life we are called to live. We are called to be successful. We are called to be rich. We are called to prosper. But when we do, when we are rich, we are successful, we are prosperous, it is so that we can give more for the kingdom of God. For the advancement of the gospel. God does not want us poor. Brothers and sisters. He does not want us sick. He does not want us helpless. He does not want us struggling and weak. This is what Jesus wants for us. And for that we need to start acting on the word. And then we will always walk. 
as a success. And the key is to abide in his word. To abide in his word, to meditate on the word. The word should be on our mouth, in, in our mouth. The word should be in our mind. And the word should be what we are living every moment. Every moment as the spirit speaks to us, we need to agree with the word and walk in it. And we walk in it. When the Holy Spirit speaks to us, when the Holy Spirit speaks all the time, so when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, we need to respond. We need to say yes and do it. And do the word. Doing the word with actions that, you know, that, that uh, make your obedience obvious. We can't say yes, yes, I'm obeying you, Lord. I obey you. I obey you. I agree with you. I obey you. And not act. And not do it. So the, the key to seeing net breaking success it has everything to do with the word of God and our response to the word in our lives, dear brothers and sisters. Okay? Remember, Psalm, chapter, Psalm 1, verses 1 to 3. Blessed is the man, blessed is the woman who walks not, I'm not quoting verse 1. Yeah, but verse 3. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. And if you live like this, meditating on the law of God, meditating on the word of God. And the psalmist, the psalmist is talking mainly about the Old Testament. He's not talking about his psalms. He's not talking about the letters, the books of the prophets. Nothing was there except the first five books that are credited to Moses. So the psalmist is saying, if you're meditating on the first five books, that is called the law, okay? And you're meditating on that day and night. What is the result? What is the outcome? It says he's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Brothers and sisters, just meditating on Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. This is the kind of life the psalmist lived. This is the life the psalmist lived. Like a tree planted by streams of water, yielding fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. And imagine if we start taking God's word seriously, we have so much more. We have so much more than the law. We have the prophets. We have the Psalms. We have all of the wonderful, amazing, unimaginable New Testament. The New Testament. The Psalmist doesn't even know. You know, he had no clue that God had so much more to show, so much more to reveal when he gave the word. And how much more successful, how much more we should be Walking like this, like trees planted by streams of water. Imagine a tree planted by streams of water does not care whether it is hot, whether it is dry, because it's not getting affected. It's not getting affected because its roots are in the water. So no matter how much of water, how much of heat it's facing, how many problems, how many difficulties, how whatever the enemy throws at you, it will not affect you. It will not affect us. What will we do? We will keep on yielding fruit. Because our leaves are green perpetually. They're evergreen. Its leaf does not wither. It yields fruit in its season. In all that he does, he prospers. How much more we have. How much more reason we have, dear brothers and sisters, to prosper. To truly be blessed. Be the blessed ones. The psalmist was just talking about the law. First five books of the Bible. We have, do you know how many books are there in the Bible? 73. 73. He was talking about five. We have 68 more than he has. 68 more. Can you imagine how much more prosperous we should be? How much more successful? How much more blessed? But the key is meditating on the law day and night. Meditating on the word day and night. So have the word in your heart, in your mind and keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. 
That is the key to working in this kind of success. Okay? So why, why should our nets be breaking? Why should they be breaking? Is it important? Brothers and sisters, we are called to live our life in Christ. So, our life in Christ must be like the life of Christ. Okay? What is the kind of life that Jesus lived? That is the life that you and I are called to live. So, if you know, many people, because Jesus was crucified, and he was crucified with two thieves, one on the right, one on the left, many Christians, many, many Christians, don't really think that Jesus' life was a life of success. It was really a life of success. Because of which, they also have settled down, you know, to a mediocre life, to a miserable life, thinking, oh, it's okay, yeah, this Jesus also walked like this, he also struggled, so therefore we also should struggle. I think you need to have your eyes open to see the reality, to see the truth. When you look at life, the life of Jesus, what do you see? Do you see his life as a failure or as a success? Because your life is should be modeled on the life of Jesus. Are you modeling your life after a failure or after a success? You tell me. Did Jesus always live in victory? What do you think? Did he always live in victory? Was the cross of Jesus a symbol of shame or glory? What do you think? So when you look at Jesus, what is the, what is the, you know, what, what impacts you about the life of Jesus? Do you want to walk in his footsteps? You can only walk in his footsteps if you get the answer to these questions correctly. And you will want to walk like Jesus. So did Jesus live and die as a loser or as an absolute winner? Or as an absolute winner? Like no, none else. Like no other name. Like no other person before him. Or even after him. So let's look at the life of Jesus, dear brothers and sisters. He healed all the sick. Okay? No debate about that. So every sick person who came to him, he was more successful than all the doctors in the whole universe put together. Because every sickness he defeated, he healed. Okay? He raised those who were untimely dead. Those whom he knew, those who he did not even know, he raised them if they had died an untimely death. How many people have this kind of success when it comes to raising the dead? He delivered the oppressed. Anyone who was demon-possessed, who was oppressed by any kind of demon, struggling with any affliction, possession, anything to do with the devil, he delivered them all. He preached the good news to the poor. Anyone who was open to receiving the good news had an opportunity to hear the good news from Jesus. Freely he received, freely he gave. He set every captive free. So, you know, it, in, in fact, uh, some, of the, some of the texts in the gospel says, when, when Jesus moved out of the town, every sick person in that town was healed. Everyone who was oppressed was, was delivered. Whole towns, whole villages set free. Set free. And this is the life of Jesus, dear brothers and sisters. He defeated the devil. He defeated death. He defeated the grave. No, none of, <coughs> none of our enemies could ever stand against him. So this is the life of Jesus, dear brothers and sisters. You know why Jesus was crucified? Because of this. Because he was so successful at everything he did that the Pharisees, the scribes were so jealous, 
so envious of him. That is the reason they crucified him. That is the reason they crucified him. Because they were so jealous of his success. Of his success. You know, if, if people envy you for all the right reasons, then you can know, then you can be sure that you're a successful person. That you're a successful person. So this is the life of Jesus. It was an absolute resounding success in every way. In every way. So dear brothers and sisters, see what Philippians chapter 2 verses 6 to 11 says. Who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Jesus is God, eternal. And he emptied himself and became one of us. He became one of us. And not just one of us, he became a slave. He wanted to serve us. That's the reason he came. And being found in human form, he humble, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You know, so sometimes when you look at what Jesus went through, you know, maybe you feel, oh, he went through all this, he went through all this, oh yeah, poor thing, poor Jesus. You know, many of us probably have that poor Jesus kind of a mentality, you know. We feel sorry for Jesus. You don't have to feel sorry for Jesus. We don't have to. Okay? Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name. And so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. This is success. This is what success looks like. He made himself so low so that God exalted him. God exalted him. And every tongue confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Whether they believe in Jesus or not, they have to one day acknowledge every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Brothers and sisters, you want to see success? This is success. On earth and in heaven forever and ever. This is what Jesus' life looks like, is like, and that's the life you and I are called to live, are called to live today. Because we represent him here on earth. We are his ambassadors. We have to look like our king. We have to resemble our king. So when we are living our life in Christ, your brothers and sisters, our life in Christ must be like the life of Christ. It must be like the life of Christ because we are walking in the footsteps of our victorious Lord and Savior. Therefore, our life too must be victorious. A life of triumph, a life of success, a life of glory. Jesus' nets were always breaking as he was always led by the Holy Spirit. And if you and I, dear brothers and sisters, ours also must be the same way. Because we, that is, that is what the Holy Spirit wants. The Holy Spirit, you know, God did not, uh, you know, did not give up his son for you and me to be a flop, to be a failure. Remember that. That, that would that would absolutely put you know put our uh, heavenly make our heavenly father's head hang down in shame if we have lived our life as a flop and a failure. That's not why he gave us the Holy Spirit to make a mess of our lives. The Holy Spirit has been given to us to make us like Jesus, to succeed in everything. So like master, like disciples, that's the life you and I are called to live and walk in, dear brothers and sisters. So how do we experience net breaking success? It has to, everything to do with the word of God. It has everything to do with the word. Peter experienced net breaking success. How? When? The reason for it is, Jesus, Simon said, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. So what are we doing? What are we doing? Are we also acting on the word? He acted on the word and that's how his whole life changed completely. Yes, dear brothers and sisters, that is when Peter experienced, immediately experienced success. Net-breaking success. 
And when they had done this, they enclosed a, enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. It was obviously something that Peter had never seen in his life. I mean, if he was used to seeing nets breaking, then he wouldn't have been so impressed. It was something that none of them had ever seen in their life. Maybe none of the fishermen had ever seen in their lives. And that's, that's, that's the, you know, promise. That's the blessing of acting on the word. And the sooner we act on the word without any ifs and buts and terms and conditions, brothers and sisters, the sooner we will see this kind of success. We'll say, I'll do this if, if this works out, if that happens. I did this, but last time it did not happen that way. So, you know, I felt it was no use. It was this, it was that. Ifs and buts, terms and conditions do not apply. Do not apply. Obey. Unconditional obedience. The sooner we do this, the sooner the word will work for us. Will work. Because the, the thing about the word working is, when we hear the word, we have to believe. Okay? It works when we believe and act. It doesn't just ma just magically work. It's not magic. It's faith. It's faith, dear brothers and sisters, that brings this kind of life, that brings this kind of success. When Peter heard Jesus' word, he believed. He believed and he responded. That is what will ensure we walk with nets, nets breaking. And for this, we must, what must we do? Go through another kind of new birth. There is another new birth that you and I need to go through. And what is this new birth? This is the new birth that Peter talks about. How amazing is that? In 1 Peter chapter two, chapter 1, verse 23, it says, You have been born anew, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. There is another kind of new birth that we need to we need to go through. We need to be born into the new birth through the living and enduring, through the living and abiding word of God. It is this new birth that brings true transformation, radical transformation in our lives, dear brothers and sisters. If we are born anew through the word of God, through the living and abiding word of God. This is the new birth through the word that you and I, all of us must experience, must experience. And St. Peter invites us to experience this in his, in his epistle. It's being born in you through the living and abiding word. It's a kind of new birth. It's another kind of new birth. We do talk about, you know, uh, this, this new birth that, that we need to experience is something that has happened already, but not yet. Not yet. Because we're seeing it in part, but not full. But not fully. Not fully. It's already, because it's already accomplished in baptism. In baptism, we have been born into, into a new creation in Christ. And Christ is the word. Christ is the living word. And yet, you know, it's not yet realized because it is fully and finally realized only when we gain knowledge. When we gain knowledge and we start uh, you know, assimilating, receiving, understanding the word. The word of God. So this is the opening of our spiritual eyes to brothers and sisters that St. Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 8. That the eyes of our understanding may be enlightened. That is so important. That is another, another stage of the new birth. The new birth that we are called to be born into. It's, you know, uh, it's the, uh, it, it speaks about the opening of our spiritual eyes through the entrance of the word. Through the entrance of the word. Because most of us receive, you know, have been baptized as babies. So what word of God did we have at that time? Nothing. Nothing. As babies, our, our parents and godparents said yes, made all the promises on our behalf. So we, we did become new creations at that time. We got a new spirit. But our mind, our mind still was not renewed. 
There was potential for renewal of the mind because the spirit has already been opened. The spirit has already been opened, but only when the word enters into us can the our spiritual eyes, the eyes of our heart, the eyes of our understanding be really open. Psalm 119 verses one, verse 130 says, the entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. It gives understanding. So through the word of God, we get understanding. Otherwise, we are just simple. It's just simple. The word simple here is not a good word. It's a, it means fool. It means foolish. It means the one who is stupid, who lacks understanding. So when we receive the word, we're no longer foolish. We're no longer stupid. We receive understanding. We begin to understand what? Not just normal things, you know, that we can study history, civics, geography, general knowledge, science, and all those things and gain understanding and knowledge of things of the world. We gain spiritual understanding of spiritual truths, spiritual realities. And that's what makes, that's what sets us apart. That's what sets us apart. We know things of the spirit that the world has no clue about. That is the understanding that comes when the word enters into us. We allow the word to enter. John chapter 3 verse 5. Jesus tells Nicodemus, Truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So brothers and sisters, I'm still talking about the other new birth. And the word water and the spirit shows that there is, there is more than just the spirit. And this water, is it just the water of baptism that is poured, you know, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, water is poured. Is that the water? Or is it the water of the Jordan? Is it the water of, of a tank in which a person is immersed? No. No, it's not. Where do we see this? Where do we see this? How do we know that this water that Jesus is talking about is not just physical water? We know it through the word. We know it through the word. See what Ephesians chapter 5 verses 25 and 26 says. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And did what? To make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. See the imagery here. The word is what cleanses and washes what do we normally wash with? We wash with water. We wash with water. Here's the image. Jesus made his body, his body, the church, clean by washing her with the word. So there is another new birth. The washing, the regeneration with the word, dear brothers and sisters. The water is the word that cleanses and sanctifies our mind. That is what we constantly speak about. We speak about the renewal of the mind with the word. That is the cleansing of the mind with the water of the word. That is the new birth. Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 36. Sorry, I think I made a mistake. Ezekiel, that is Ezekiel, E Z E 36 verses 25 and 26. The Lord is saying, I will sprinkle clean water on you. What water is that? That's the water of the word. And you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart. A new heart is a new spirit and I will put a new spirit in you. So there is a, there is a cleansing with the water of the word and the receiving of a new spirit. Of a new spirit. And I will take out of you your stony heart, stubborn heart and give you a tender responsive heart. A tender responsive heart. A tender, responsive heart is a heart that has been renewed with the word, with the word. That's the kind of heart which will respond to the word. It will respond to the word. That's why it's a responsive heart. It's a responsive heart. This is what Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 33 says. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them and I will write them on their hearts. What is God writing on our hearts? His word, his word, that is what we call the renewal of the mind. I will be their God and they will be my people. I will be their father and they will be my children. That is what the Holy Spirit does for us as we receive the word. Dear brothers and sisters, 
you know, the for net net breaking success begins with the new birth in the word, the new birth in the word, because we need to start allowing that mind to be renewed, and that is what you know. We so so long so that we will no longer be just hearers of the word, so that we hear and do the word, we hear and act on it. That's what Peter did. Peter heard. Peter did. Peter succeeded. Peter succeeded because he heard and he believed, of course. Yes, you, you hear and you believe and you do. And you do. Hearing of the word generates faith. Generates faith. Peter did not just do. He believed and he did. And that's how Peter succeeded. This is what we see. You remember when Peter walked on the water? He walked at the command of Jesus in John, in Matthew, sorry, in Matthew chapter 14, verse 28. Then, you know, Peter's, they're, they're all watching Jesus walking on the water and they're getting frightened. And then what happens? Jesus says, fear not, it is I. So what did Peter say? Then Peter called to him and said, Lord, if it's really you, command me to come to you walking on the water. What a strange thing to say. Peter didn't just say, okay, if it's you, Lord, I'm coming. He didn't say that. He said, no, you command me to come. And what did Jesus say? Come. Jesus said, come. And what happened? Peter became the first man to walk on water. Do you think he walked on water? No. He didn't walk on water. He walked on the word. He walked on the word. When he walked on the word, that water became solid ground. That water became solid ground. That's how he was able to walk. As long as he kept his eyes on Jesus. Who's Jesus? Jesus is the word. Jesus is the word, dear brothers and sisters. As long as his eyes were on the word, as long as he acted and believed and obeyed the word, he walked on water. He walked on water. That is the power of the word. And when we believe and do, we too will do the impossible. So dear brothers and sisters, the regeneration of the spirit is instantaneous. It happens in an instant and baptism. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. In one instant, in one instant, this happens in baptism, we get a new spirit, a new heart. In one second, in one second, it happens. But the renewal of the mind is a process, is a lifelong process because it is very different from the renewal of the spirit. It begins at baptism, but requires our cooperation with the Holy Spirit. It requires dedication because it takes effort. It involves, you know, dedication, time, effort, discipline, because we have to take that word. We have to read. We have to understand. We have to meditate. We have to make the effort to renew our mind because a renewed mind is a renewed man or a renewed woman. Not otherwise. Not otherwise, dear brothers and sisters. That is what gives you a powerful mind. The mind of Christ has to be formed in you. The mind of Christ has to be formed in each one of us. And not without effort. Not without discipline and dedication. Romans 12 verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable and perfect. St. Paul is saying, be transformed. You be transformed. This is the ESV. See what the NLT says. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person. So who's going to do it? God is going to do it. How? By changing the way you think. And to change the way you think, you have to, you have to force yourself to think a different way, in a different way. You have to think what the word says. You have to think like Jesus. You have to develop the mind of Christ. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, what is good, pleasing, and perfect. 
it is your work it is god's work it's a work of the holy spirit we need to cooperate we need to cooperate so why are we struggling to see our nets breaking dear brothers and sisters we're struggling because we are I would just bring a highlight a few lessons from the parable of the sower. What happened? We hear the word, but we allow it to be stolen. We don't pay attention to the word. We don't meditate on the word. Then the devil comes and steals that word from our heart. Steals, steals that word from our heart. So then that word cannot be effective. That word cannot bear fruit. And again, maybe we hear the word, but we're not allowing it to take root. So when the sun comes up, when difficulties come, when, you know, when we go through hot, trying seasons of dryness, of struggles, we allow this word to be scotched. That word has not taken root, therefore it will not bear fruit. Then what happens? Maybe we hear the word, but we're allowing that word to be choked. There are so many things. Along with the word, we bring all the philosophies, the teachings, the deception of the world. So the word and the world are trying to grow together. What happens? The word is choked by the world, by the weeds. And that's what happens. When we don't allow the word to take prominence in our life, give importance to the word, to meditating on the word, to allowing our, our life to be transformed by the word, then the word will just get choked. And we will not be seeing success, neither 30-fold, not 60-fold, and definitely not 100-fold. That's when our life will not, we will not see net-breaking success. And again, the parable from of the wise and the foolish man, what happens? Hearing the word, but not building our life on it. Hearing the word and saying, oh, wow, so nice. Oh, the teaching was so good. Oh, that uh, sermon that priest preached, so wonderful. But doing nothing about it. Not allowing it to transform our lives. Sorry. Building our life on the rock takes effort. Building on sand is very easy. You hear the word, do nothing about it, that is building on sand. When you do nothing, that is, that's building your life on the sand. But if you are building on the rock, a rock is not easy to build on, to lay a foundation. It takes more effort. It takes more drilling. It takes more, more energy. It takes more time. But it's worth it. Because when the storms of life come, when the rains come, when the floods rise, what happens? The house on the rock stands firm. Stands firm. So, how can we ensure our nets are always breaking, dear brothers and sisters? By pondering on the word like Mother Mary. The word needs, you know, your mind needs to be occupied with the word. We need to think about the word. We need to meditate on the word. See what Luke chapter 2 verse 51 says. Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. This is Jesus after he was found in the temple. And he returned to Nazareth and was obedient to, them, obedient to uh, Mary and Joseph. And his mother stored all these things. There were so many things I'm sure that Jesus said and did in his life that Mary did not even understand. But she didn't let it just go. Maybe there are verses in the Bible that you and I don't understand fully. Don't just let them go. Ponder them. Store them. She stored all these things. She treasured these things. She pondered them in her heart. That is the way to ensure that our, our nets are always breaking. Our mind should constantly be pondering on the word of God like Mary. Like Mary. And yet, we should have conscious meditation on the word like the psalmist. In Psalm 1, I already spoke about this. Blessed is the man, blessed is the woman whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Are we delighted with the word of God, dear brothers and sisters? Is the word our delight? Does it 
bring joy inexpressible to our hearts. That's what it means to be delighted with the law. I would not be delighted with Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, sorry, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I have so much more to be delighted about. And I do delight in the word. And I do delight in the word. It's the, my, it's, it's the most thrilling experience for me. It's become that way now. That's what I love to talk about. You know, the, the revelations that the Lord gives me. Colin and I spent so long, you know, so much of time just talking about the about the word of God. We delight in it. It makes us so happy. You're so happy. We are truly, truly blessed because we receive so much of insight, so much of revelation from the Holy Spirit. That's because we give our mind to it. We consciously choose to meditate on the word and the word gets deeper and deeper and deeper. It just jumps out of those pages for us. I have not seen that before. But I'm seeing it now because the Holy Spirit is giving revelation as we consciously delight in his word and meditate on it day and night. Day and night. That's what I do. That's what I honestly do. My mind is almost all the time either talking to the Holy Spirit or I'm meditating on the word and I'm bringing that word back, talking about it to the Holy Spirit. Best person to discuss the word with, the author and the best teacher, the Holy Spirit. And I receive so much of revelation, so much depth, so much of depth, dear brothers and sisters. And if, if the psalmist says day and night, it means all the time. So what about our work? What about the, the things we need to do? When you're constantly meditating on the word, the things you need to do, you will start doing with the wisdom of God, not with the wisdom of man, not with the wisdom of past experiences. The Holy Spirit will inspire you. To be an outstanding all-round success. And the solutions that you and I will find to the problems in the world will be from the Holy Spirit. Not from the knowledge that the word gives us, that the world gives us. So that's why your mind should be occupied with the word. When any problem comes, when any situation comes, you will deal with it according to the wisdom of God. And then we need to give ourselves a diligent study of the word like Timothy. Like St. Paul tells Timothy, what does he say in 2 Timothy 2.15? He says, study to show yourself approved unto God. We need to study. We need to spend time immersed to prove that we have been approved by God. If you want to show people who you are, that you are, you are a wonderful disciple of the Lord, spend time studying. A disciple needs to be disciplined in studying. He's like a student. A disciple is a student, a student of the word. And then a workman, okay? He says, be a study to show yourself, to prove yourself, to prove to others that you are approved by God. A workman that need not be ashamed. You know, when are we ashamed? When we are ignorant. Ignorance always brings shame. So when you spend time studying, you will be like a good workman who need not be ashamed due to ignorance of the word. Rather, sorry, you will be rightly dividing, rightly understanding and breaking the word of truth. Rightly. The correct interpretation. Not interpretation based on, on past failures. Saying, oh, I prayed for this person. They didn't get healed. Therefore, it's never not the will of God to heal everybody. That person got healed. This person didn't get healed. So God's will is for healing, for sickness, 50-50. 50 percent 50. 50 gets healed. 50 percent does not get healed. God knows why. That is not right way of dividing the word. Your right dividing should be based on the life of Jesus. How was Jesus' success? 100 percent. 100 percent. So if you and I are not getting 100 percent success, that cannot be God's will. Because the will of God was clearly established for us in the life of Christ. We should aim for what Jesus did and, as Jesus said, for greater, for greater things. Greater things. So don't settle for any lies. That is wrong understanding of the word of God. 
to think, oh, some get healed, some don't get healed. That's wrong. Jesus healed every sick person. He delivered everyone who was oppressed of the devil. That is the right understanding of the word. So make sure that your understanding of the word is based on, you know, backed by the life of Jesus. The life of Jesus. And finally, we develop a winner's mindset, dear brothers and sisters. You cannot experience success if you're a loser in your mind. So you and I need to develop a winner's mindset like Paul. Like Paul. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 8. What is Paul doing? And Paul is so confident. He says, and now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And can you see this picture? Where is Paul sitting? He's in prison. He's in chains. Maybe he was in house arrest. He could not freely move around. But what is Paul looking at? Is he looking at the chains? Is he looking at the bars of the prison? No, he's looking at the crown of righteousness. He says, I've done whatever I had to do. I've run the race. I've fought the fight. I've won the, won the race. I've, I've finished the race. And he said, now I'm waiting for my crown. Paul was so confident that he's a winner all the way. He's the winner all the way. He's always conscious of his victory. Of his victory, he says, doesn't matter whatever persecution I faced. I was shipwrecked. I was, I almost, uh, I was stoned, stoned to death, almost stoned to death. I was, I was beaten. I was scourged. I was, I was robbed. I was, every negative thing that happened, he didn't let it bother him. His mind was, you know, his, it was so rooted in his victory. He was so conscious of what, what he, what is waiting for him. His eye was, you know, he was sitting in prison physically, but on a throne spiritually. On a throne spiritually. That's you and me, dear brothers and sisters. That is, that is how you and I have to live. We need to live and develop a winner's mindset like Paul. Colossians 3, one, verse 1 says, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, sorry, set your sights on the realities of heaven. Don't get bogged down by what's happening in you around you. Our eyes should be on heaven. And heaven is not there. Heaven is here. Because God is here within us, in our hearts. That victory is already ours. That crown is already inside. It's already within us. And our sights, our eyes should constantly base, be, be on those realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand and you and I are seated with him seated with him. We're not affected by situations and circumstances but we walk like him. And let's keep on you know, if, if that is what's in your mind, affirm yourself accordingly. Affirm yourself according to this reality. Ephesians 2 verse 6. And God has raised us up with Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that's, that's where we are. In the spirit we're already in that on the throne, in Christ. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind and don't accept defeat. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, it says, By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, also, as he is, so also are we in this world. And how is Jesus now? Jesus now is seated on the throne. And it is to him every knee shall bow. And every tongue confess that he is Lord. And if he is Lord, we are too. We too are lords. We are also kings with him. That is our privilege in Christ. So see him on the throne and see yourself seated along with him. With the enemy underneath your feet. Romans 8.37 No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. See yourself as you really are, brothers and sisters, in Christ Jesus. And you will always walk victoriously. And success can easily be measured. Can easily be measured. It's not something vague. Our success can be measured because we need to get results like Jesus. We need to get results like Jesus. In all that we do, we prosper. We walk in health. We walk in wealth. We walk in 
a blessing on all our relationships. That is the promise. We don't accept sickness in ourselves or in those around us. We cast it out. We command it to leave. And we get success, just like Jesus. We walk in wealth. We walk in sufficiency. Because he became poor. Jesus became poor so that you and I might be rich. We might have enough. We might have more than enough to give. To give to everyone who is in need. That is the kind of success that we need to experience. Neck-breaking success in all our relationships. Our relationships should be blessed. Our relationships should, relationship should be blessed, your brothers and sisters. Whether it's our marriage, whether it's our relationship with our children, at work, that is, that is net-breaking success. People should be able to look at us and say, you're different. I want to be like you. And that is an open door to preach the gospel, to tell people why we are different, why we are different. So in conclusion, dear brothers and sisters, remember what happened. Jesus met Peter for the first time three years earlier and his nets were breaking. And Jesus said, leave it all. Come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And Peter did it. But Peter went through his own trial and testing time because he denied Jesus. Jesus wanted to restore all things to Peter. So he met him again at a lake. And he calls out. Peter said, I'm going fishing. And so many went with him. They were wondering, are we supposed to leave being fishers of men and going back, go back to being fishers of fish. So Jesus meets him there on the shore. Jesus does not get into Peter's boat. Jesus gets tells Peter, it's time for you to get out of the boat forever. Forever, no more running away from your call, from the success that I want to give you. So Jesus calls out, children, have you caught anything? Why is he calling them children? Because they were acting like children. They were acting immature. So Jesus was meeting Peter again at the lake. And Peter was not, you know, the same person. He knew he had abandoned Jesus. He had denied Jesus. He was very, very guilty. He was upset with himself. He went back fishing and took so many along with him. But Jesus does not get into his boat. In fact, Jesus gets Peter out of the boat. And at this time, how does Peter recognize? How do, how do the disciples all recognize that it was Jesus? Because again, he uses the same strategy. Nets. Full of fish. Full of fish. Jesus said, cast out to the other side. And they took a catch of 153 huge fish. But the nets didn't break. Why? Because this is a different kind of net. This is all about the kingdom of God. There's room for more and more fish. And the nets will never break. The nets will never break. Dear brothers and sisters, we are called to walk in success. It's not about fish. It's not about health. It's not about your wealth. It's not about your relationships. It's about bringing people into the kingdom. And with net breaking success, you and I can attract them to the kingdom of God. Better than with empty nets. That's our calling, dear brothers and sisters. There's always room for more in the kingdom. So as Jesus restores Peter, granting him net-breaking success once again, and he tells him, leave it all and come. Let go of your failure. 
wherever you seem to be stuck. Let it go. Get back. Grab hold of Jesus once again. Allow the Holy Spirit to make a success out of it. Walk with your nets breaking always as you continually yield to the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord. We praise you and we bless you. Shady Alaria said, one money a shakari or a loria says, Yabadomna Shara. I'm Nikia Loria says, I'm an Akia Shara Laria said, Kiora Lo Shabama. Shnamaria said, what of Lee Shabaronia says, Likia Shlava. Ella Vesa was a la flashy Nikia Shazia la Gloria Ba. Levoria said, one of Nia Shakam. Holy Spirit, take complete control of our lives. We too have said yes to Jesus. We want to walk with net breaking success. Use us mightily, Lord. And may the success that we experience in life and all that we do, may we too prosper experiencing your success, the kind of success you want us to experience every moment of our lives. Just like Jesus, may we too walk continually yielded to you, praying in tongues, rooted in the word, so that we can live and function just like Jesus with net breaking success every moment of our lives. In the mighty and the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <laughs>